Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Doug Roberts from PS21. Um, if you haven't been to a PS21 event before, we host events about planning in Portsmouth. Our past events have included uh, Jeff Speck's appearance here, uh, something on affordable housing with Jennifer Hurley, uh, climate change with Cameron Wake, and a host of other topics. Uh, tonight's event is about tactical urbanism, a collection of quick, inexpensive, and tempor temporary actions in cities that have the potential for long-term change. The speaker is Mike Leiden, an urban planner who is often credited with coining the term tactical urbanism. He is head of the Street Plans Collaborative New York office, the organizer of the Open Streets Project, which we had one here on Lincoln Street um, year before last, where everyone, uh, they cleared off the street, let people ride bikes on the street for uh, a full day. And uh, he led, uh, he's the co-author of the Smart Growth Manual with Jeff Speck and Andres Duani, which was in 2009 and was a seminal book in, about smart growth. Uh, PS21, working with Mike Leiden, the city and West End businesses and residents uh, is uh, undertaking its own tactical urbanism project. Uh, we're calling it Islington Street Lab. Uh, Mike will explain about it during this talk and you'll be able to go out um, starting tomorrow and see the changes to the street uh, which will last through the weekend. So our sponsors are up here on the screen. There are nearly 30 businesses that have contributed or sponsored the event. Um, City of Portsmouth, Griffin Family Corporation, Harbor Light Strategic Marketing, New Hampshire Charitable Foundation gave us a major grant, uh, Port One Architects, BHB is the company that's doing the long-term redesign of Islington Street, uh, Weekender House, White Heron, Coffee and Tea. And then our season sponsors, Chinberg Properties, Piscataqua Savings Bank, Seacoast Rotary Club, and Corway Film Institute, which is recording tonight's uh, presentation. And these are our event partners. Uh, quite a few businesses from the West End who have contributed in kind or are supporting us in one way or another, and we really appreciate their support. So uh, Mike, this is now Mike Leiden. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. How are you doing? Doing well. All right. Everyone have a drink if they want one. I understand the bar is open. Um, I'm just going to drink water for now. I hope that's okay. Um, so I want to thank um, all the sponsors and the project partners to not only bring me here, be able to work with you all, um, but to help produce this event. And as I'll show you in a minute, these projects uh, don't get done without collaboration and partnerships. Um, and so it's a really, it's an amazing opportunity to bring all these different kinds of community partners and people together to work on something that's quick, that's fun, that's hands-on. And none of this would be possible without the leadership of, of Doug and Peter from PS21 and, and their whole team. So um, just a big thank you to, to those who've been working behind the scenes a lot in the last um, few weeks to make this happen. Um, so I really enjoy coming to Portsmouth. I showed this slide and I uh, gave a, a workshop about this project a couple weeks ago. Um, but you know, Portsmouth is known, I think, the world over as one of these really wonderful old New England towns. I grew up in Maine, so it's a very familiar environment to be back here. And you know, what's interesting is that this kind of a street, this kind of environment, is so popular now and so exciting to so many different kinds of people that we're seeing all over the country, not just in Portsmouth or New England, we're seeing these kinds of places become um, expensive and challenging to rent storefront space or to own an apartment, uh, to rent an office, et cetera, which is why I think we're seeing a lot of the pressure start to spread out from downtown Portsmouth to the edges, which includes the West End where we're working. Um, you know, new areas that were not once considered for new investment are now the targets of that investment, which comes with a lot of good things and some challenges. So we see this approach of tactical urbanism as a way to help community members digest some of that change, experiment with some of these changes on the streets with uh, public spaces, private spaces as well. Um, so I think it's an exciting time and a really important time in Portsmouth's uh, uh, future. 
So Street Plans, our company, we are uh, based in three different cities. Um, as Doug mentioned, I'm based in New York. Um, we do a lot of planning and design consulting work with cities, nonprofits, community groups, um, all over the country uh, and, and sometimes abroad. Uh, but a really big part of our work is the research and advocacy piece. So the, the work that we do is, as consultants is largely informed by the advocacy that we do in our own communities, in our own neighborhoods, where, um, where we all live at our, at our company. And we like to research new ideas and get those ideas out to people in the hands of people that can make changes in their own communities as well. Um, Again, we, we work on a variety of projects. Tonight I'm really talking about this placemaking idea and how tactical urbanism is a tool to help communities do that. If you want to learn more about our work and our advocacy and our writing, you know, please uh, feel free to go to our website. Um, but oftentimes we're asked to look at streets like these, um, which um, at a quick look may seem, well, that's just a pleasant you know, suburban street somewhere in the United States. It happens to be outside of St. Louis, um, but it's also a very uh, dangerous and difficult place to bike or to walk. Pretty much to do anything but drive a car. Um, so for a client out in the St. Louis area, we came up with a vision for that street, which was this. Expand sidewalks, ADA compliant, lots of bike space, made it much more clear, high visibility crossings, uh, islands, medi uh, island medians and trees to help you have a place to rest halfway across the street, these kinds of things. Um, but this is the easy part, coming up with that vision the before and the after, which planners love to do and architects love to do, um, is the simple part. The challenge is how you convince people in your community that this is a good idea. You know, um, This may look good on the screen and on paper, but once you have to go and start talking to local businesses and residents, it just gets more and more difficult, right? Um, and that's probably why 80% of plans don't get implemented. And as a planner, as someone who loves to think long term and about transformation in cities and towns all over, I find that very, very frustrating. And I found that frustrating very early on in my career when I was doing some consulting work, um, when I was living and working in Miami, that the, the big project, the big vision, the big change was so necessary but so difficult to achieve. Um, so I started to you know, look for ways around that issue and that challenge. And I think this quote really sums it up well from Jane Jacobs, if you know her, she's one of the uh, most uh, preeminent writers uh, and authors about cities um, ever. And she says that city planning lacks tactics for building cities that work like cities, meaning city planners have a hard time doing the small things and the experiments and the one-off projects that lead to the next one. We're really hard at the, it's really hard for planners to do the incremental change. We all want the big, quick change. And those projects are one, two per generation. Um, so we're trying to, again, find new ways around that. So we need new methods for building cities. And I think we have this huge untapped um, potential in neighborhoods to work with people who live there, to have them physically develop and work together with the city to create these changes, or at least show what is possible in the short term. Um, so this question early on in my career kept coming up. What can we do now? What can we get implemented? How do we get momentum going? How do I take my impatient attitude and, and get something done on the streets? And so I'll take us back to 2008 and back to the city of Miami. This is downtown. Um, at the time, it was starting to be revitalized. New condos were being built, some new businesses. But on the weekends, it was still a ghost town. Um, and we wanted to transform this environment. And we wanted to show people what a more bike and pedestrian friendly city would look like. Um, at the time, Miami was ranked one of the top uh, w three worst cities to bike in across the United States. I mean, it's still one of the top four most dangerous places to bike, which is a really huge challenge, but we wanted to find ways that we could actually instigate this transformation with these short-term events. And so we organized what's called Open Streets, which, as Doug mentioned, you guys have done, I guess, apparently once um, here in Portsmouth. And the idea was not to have plans and fancy renderings, but to actually give people experiences. Get them out on the street, walking, meeting each other, biking. Have that experience where you actually know what the street could perform like or could feel like if certain investments and changes were made. And it was really as a tool for us as advocates to, um, to embed this idea and build support and political will to invest in the plan, to invest in the, in the infrastructure changes that were so desperately needed. And so this um, initiative was such a hit with the mayor and um, his staff who helped usher this through that for the next nine months through the rest of the mayor's term, 
um, we did open streets in Miami. And at that time, we started to work on a bicycle master plan as well. That's when actually when I started street plans. Uh, my first project was to help Miami do their first bike plan. Um, and it was amazing how that was a, um, such a kickstart to all these projects happening there. And so over the course of the last several years, Miami transformed very quickly and, and from being the top three worst to 2010 being number 44 and 2011 being the 30 second best city to bike in. Now that's kind of arbitrary, but in any event, they start to actually put lines on the ground and make changes and do it quickly. So we've been really fascinated by open streets. We see this wonderful, uh, fairly large scale, but very successful tactic to instigate transformation. And we're not the only ones. We've been tracking the success and the rise of open streets across the whole country. You can see here a map from, this is now a couple of years old, but there's now 130 different cities who have tried or have or maintained uh, frequent programs where once a month, once every few weeks in the summer, whatnot, cities are doing this. And we find, again, to be this gateway um, to better streets. You know, who likes to have yoga in the street? This happens to be Minneapolis, um, but a very uh, strong way to demonstrate that streets aren't just for driving. We can do lots of other things in our streets. And what's fun is that when you shut them down, you have this captive audience. You can try things with those people who show up by the thousands to demonstrate even the infrastructure changes that could come later. Um, and that's where the trend has really been, been going. And so this is the city of Los Angeles looks at open streets on, on the front end of longer term transformation. So you see, you start with open streets, they do smaller scale pop-up events, demonstration projects in neighborhoods, very similar to what we'll be doing tomorrow and f through the weekend on Islington. Um, they have a program that allows business owners and citizens to get together to do this, this work coming out of the pop-up events to do more longer lasting projects. And then together, these three steps lead into a streetscape plan. So again, it kind of turns the planning process on its head. We're so used to as planners and designers just creating this long-term vision, you know, putting our stamp on it and then saying, okay, good luck city, go build it. What this does is it actually starts with the building and the making on the front end that informs what should be in the plan itself, what works and what doesn't work in these short-term projects. So you also mentioned New York, Doug. Um, this is back again. So I was inspired in Miami working on this kind of stuff. And then at the same time, New York was transforming its streets very, very quickly, not from the bottom up, but really more from the top down, looking at opportunities to very quickly rebalance the streets. You can see the plazas here. This is, if, uh, if you don't recognize it, Columbus Circle up on Broadway near Central Park. Um, but what's really fascinating is I started to, when I started to research this project, I realized that there was a plan for that transformation back in 1969. <laughs> you know, so this was the vision created an urban design plan for Midtown, that green uh, street that kind of winds its way through the street grid, that's Broadway. And the vision was to make that a, a pedestrian park, a like a pedestrian mall all the way through the heart of the city. But of course, there was no way to convince all those property owners, all those businesses, that that was a good idea. They were proposing to do this all at once, spend millions and millions of dollars, and hope that it would work. And of course, no one would buy, on, you know, buy into that vision. So what happened? Nothing. Like with a lot of plans, nothing happened until 2009. This was Times Square. Did anyone get to witness Times Square at this time? Did anyone visit, um, say, 2009, 2013? A few of you? Pretty amazing if you were there before and after. This was just lawn chairs spent, uh, bought from a hardware store in Brooklyn for $9 a piece, thrown into the middle of the street because the cafe chairs they ordered didn't arrive in time. Sound familiar, Doug? <laughs> um, and so they threw out, the, they got creative, they threw out the, the orange cones, they shut off Times Square and said, invite people to sit down. And people knew what to do with this space. And the great thing about this was that they took this very incrementally. They didn't show somebody a big picture saying, we're going to shut down. Here's the master plan. Do you agree with it? It's like, we're going to try this for one weekend. It was actually it was Memorial Day weekend and see if it would work. And then it did work. And no one um, complained too much. You know, Carmageddon didn't break out. Um, life went on. In fact, life got better in Times Square. Um, and so they put paint on the ground, right? They didn't put permanent infrastructure. They just put paint. And they put in the umbrella chairs and made it a little bit more formal, but still temporary. They were going to collect data and see if it was actually performing like they thought it was. And what they learned was that pedestrian traffic, already super heavy, went up. Um, retail rents skyrocketed because it became a much more desirable place to be. Um, large, large decrease in traffic injuries to all street users, including drivers. Um, and it really was the signature jewel and a crown of plazas that were being built like this all over New York. We now have more than 70 of these in all five boroughs developed in the same exact manner. The very temporary, the pilot, 
you know, study what works and what doesn't, and then design the long-term plan. So in 2012, three years later, that's when this rendering was made. This was actually coming out of the experimentation. Um, and amazingly, uh, one year or two years later in 2014, um, I snapped this photo. This is that plaza under construction, and that's what it looks like now. So it's a five-year timeline, basically a capital budget cycle from lawn chairs to permanent transformation. And I know that Portsmouth, New Hampshire is not New York City, quite aware of that, um, but the process used can work anywhere. In fact, we've seen it work in lots of different kinds of contexts, small towns to, to very large cities. And so it's a process that we call build, measure, and learn. You know, build something quickly, test it out, um, see what works, and then with that data and that evaluation, learn what should the next iteration should be. So it allows us to take smaller steps, bite off smaller chunks, spend less money at the outset to make sure that our, the, the time, when the time comes to spend the big dollars, we really know what's going to work and design around that. And so we've written about this. We started writing about this idea and this trend back in 2011. We released a um, online 25-page booklet, which is a, a slightly a manifesto of sorts, but also a, case, a book of case studies showing where this, had been, this kind of process had been kickstarted by both citizens and cities around the country. And I shared that with about uh, 10 of my nerdiest friends. And I said, here's the idea. I was talking to you guys about um, some of your ideas. And so we did it like another uh, round of edits on that, and then we, you know, we released it out to the public. And I went on vacation. I came back from vacation, and um, you know, a few thousand people had read this thing. And I was thinking, that's the total surprise to me. I just shared it with 10 people, and now it's been you know, being passed around. So it, what happened was that we really struck a nerve that people were not only frustrated with the planning process as we do it typically in, in the US, but finding a lot of joy and excitement and interest in the things that we can do in the short term. And so we wrote a second volume. Then we wrote a third volume about case studies in South America with a, um, an organization based in Chile. And then we did a fourth version um, in, in Australia and New Zealand, which we partnered with an organization based in Melbourne. And so we've been trying to show and ex you know, give examples of how this stuff works in all sorts of different kinds of contexts. Our um, next volume, in fact, will be in, in Italy. Um, of all places, which is, which is going to be really great to see that come together. But all these four booklets, which are online for free, kind of were our version of writing a full-length book tactically. So iteration after iteration led to the full-length tactical urbanism book, which we published last spring with, with Island Press. So to get at this word, I know it's wonky, um, but if you think about it in isolation, not in a militaristic sense, um, but just the true definition of the word, you know, small-scale actions that serve a larger purpose. That's what really what we're talking about. And it can be led by cities, can be led by organizations like PS21, can be led by just normal citizens. Um, and it's all about the short-term, low-cost, and scalable projects that are intended from the very beginning to create long-term change. So where we make, we draw a line in the sand over what's tactical and what's not is are we actually trying to achieve a larger, longer-term vision with the short-term project? So on Islington Street, absolutely. You know, there's a whole plan that'll be developed uh, by VHB about what to do with this corridor. And we're very, very excited because our, you know, three or four-day project is a way to test out some of those concepts, which can then be, you know, vetted further and developed and put into that plan um, for investment later. But you know, not every city is Miami or New York or even Portsmouth, who is very gracious in allowing us to go play in traffic uh, tomorrow morning. Um, not every city wants to say yes. And so this is a group of residents and advocates and artists in Dallas, Texas, of all places. And the neighborhood got together, and they were having an arts festival, as they do every year. And they said, wouldn't it be great to actually try out some things we'd like to see in our neighborhood? while we're having the arts festival. So we'd have a lot of people in the neighborhood. Um, you know, we could work, you know, work with a lot of artists in the community who could help us develop the project. And so long story short, they pulled a block party permit as part of the festival for, uh, from the city. And the city thought, yeah, great, you guys do this every year, have your party, have fun. But what they didn't do is actually close the street. So this is why it's tactical. What they did do was they took over a lane of traffic, they created a temporary bike lane, they put pop-up businesses and vacant storefronts, and then they wrote on paper every single ordinance and zoning rule that they're breaking during this project. And they put on each element, we can't do this, we can't do that, we can't do this as of right, but look at the environment that it creates and the kinds of people who wanna be sitting in, on streets and having outdoor cafes and populating this neighborhood. Um, 
And lo and behold, the city you know, who showed up to this event said, actually, you're, you've got something here. Um, we should actually reconsider our, our laws. You know, so this is some of the things that they had on the books, like, you know, fee for use of public right away, including but not limited to sidewalk cafes, area times market value times 85% times 12%. <laughs> what does that even mean? You know, if you're the new business owner and you're just scraping, you know, scraping together your capital to, you know, open up and you're trying to, you know, uh, you know show people that you are uh, interested in the neighborhood, you want to pre present a welcoming storefront and you have to deal with things like this. And so again, this, they went through every single thing like this and circled it and said, this is why it's difficult to have a walkable neighborhood. And um, you know, lo and behold, this, this ordinance was created in 1941 and had not been updated since. So even the planners who looked at this thing didn't know what that meant or scratching their heads like, why is this this way? It doesn't have to be that way, right? So um, when we have zoning codes from the Leave it to Beaver era and we're now in 2016, that's a problem. That's a real problem. So if we want 21st century towns and cities, we need to think very differently about how we manage and regulate and code these cities. So one of our big takeaways is that we need new software. We need new ordinances and codes and programs and processes for these, these kinds of transformations to take place as of right. So what ultimately came out of that Dallas story was that the um, city then hired a couple of the most uh, enterprising of those art activists and said, can you go do this in this neighborhood, in this neighborhood, in that neighborhood? And that organization is now called Build a Better Block. And they've done more than 100 of these or assisted with 100 of these kinds of projects all over the world, including uh, Tehran in, uh, in Iran. They actually consulted with a group of activists through Skype to help them do a better block project in their neighborhood. So this idea appeals to a lot of people, you know? Um, and then ultimately what they decided to do is they took a plan off the shelf in Dallas to activate their very uh, unwelcoming City Hall Plaza, um, a plan that was created in 1981 that they hadn't touched since, and they made it real with all these temporary elements. And so now Dallas has a monthly plaza event where they invite entrepreneurs, they invite people to come down, musicians, they have food trucks, and they bring thousands of people into this space to demonstrate and have conversations about uh, livability and urbanism and how to redevelop and redesign the city to be more friendly to people. So the lesson here, I think, is that risks you know, really can pay off. Um, this is a great example of how uh, more on the unsanctioned guerrilla side of the spectrum, a neighborhood resident in New Haven went out in the middle of the night and painted his own crosswalk <laughs> at a very dangerous intersection. I'm not advocating you go do this tonight. Uh, if you want to do crosswalks, come tomorrow with us at 5 a.m. We're doing crosswalks. Um, but what was amazing is that the city actually saw this response and said, you know, that was technically illegal but we don't have to respond as if it's illegal. We can actually say that's an act of civic will, civic interest, how do we support this? And so what they did was they had a conversation with the neighborhood, realized that this was a real problematic intersection, and what you see below it is a design that the city developed in response to this guerrilla intervention. Um, and what's most interesting is that the guerrilla himself, Doug, um, then got elected to be a um, city alderman, right? And then from City Alderman, he's now Director of Parking and Transportation for the City of New Haven. <laughs> so if you fight the man, you have to be careful because you just might become the man before you know it. Uh, and now Doug's a client of ours trying to do this kind of stuff all over the city. <laughs> it's really great. Another quick example the, with the crosswalks is how a city can respond in a positive way. This is a project that was done in Seattle. Um, it's an African-American neighborhood that's been facing a lot of pressure around gentrification, like a lot of neighborhoods in Seattle. And around, again, around an arts festival, um, some of the neighborhood residents went out in the middle of the night and they painted the crosswalk that already existed the colors of the Pan-African flag uh, for their African arts festival. And um, the, you know, the city woke up the next day, heard about it, and said, again, that's technically illegal, but we understand why you did this. So as opposed to fight it, um, what the city did instead was create a program that any neighborhood could then paint their own crosswalks and have their own designs that really speak to the culture and history and place, which is amazing. You know, it's amazing to have a city that says, how do we work with you and create ways to say yes to placemaking, to customizing your neighborhoods, making it yours, and again, that in, the, in that act, help scale a project citywide. So one of the big challenges in cities is equity, and one thing a city can do is take a good idea from, whether it's rich, poor, black, white, whatever, and take that idea and say, we're gonna make that available to everybody. And that's exactly what Seattle has done. So we put projects 
on a spectrum from the unsanctioned to the sanctioned. And we find it fascinating how quickly things move from left to right. So there are three common applications of, of tactical urbanism. There's the guerrilla action, which I just spoke about. Um, there's collaborative demonstration projects, which is kind of the bucket that I would put our Islington Street Lab project into um, that we're doing tomorrow. And then there's this, what we call phase zero implementation. And I'm gonna show you some examples of these and then give you one longer case study at the end. So quickly, we, we did some work back in 2013 in Hamilton, Ontario, a, um, a uh, advisory, sorry, um, advocacy group comprised of architects asked us to come teach them about tactical urbanism, do a workshop hands-on. And what we decided to do was um, select five different sites around the, the city. And we'd try five different ideas. And the Society of Architects put in about $5,000 total for all five sites. So it was about a $1,000 budget for each. And the idea was that we do this workshop with um, neighborhood residents and groups within these five sites. I would come back two weeks later, give a public lecture kind of like this and show the results of those projects on the ground that got built. Um, the, the theme from the workshop became let's calm our streets, let's reclaim some of the space, and then let's recreate it in the long term. And there you see those, those locations, more suburban, more urban, downtown, neighborhoody, um, very different contexts. And one of the projects, which I thought was great, um, was they actually stole shopping carts from the nearby tire store and they mounted a message in a rendering on top of those, those um, shopping carts, and they went around the intersection and around the intersection and around the intersection every time they had the pedestrian light, and then handed out information to drivers about their vision for what that intersection could be. So tactical, for sure, but it was not successful. You know, nothing actually came of that action. And so that's one of these lessons as well, that sometimes these projects don't go well. They don't succeed. They don't create the long-term change. But the act of trying, again, is the whole, the whole point. But one of the projects that did work um, was this one on the intersection. It was called a Lock and Herkimer Street. So this is my client, Graham, who's a young architect. I think he's about, he's my age. And this is him in the middle of the night screwing cones into the asphalt. And speaking of build, measure, learn, what Graham learned very quickly is that you probably shouldn't screw cones into the asphalt. <laughs> you know, the dr kept kicking back on him. Anyways, he stopped that madness. And instead, he put flowers on the top of each of these cones so that everyone in the morning would know it was not a city project. And this is what it looked like. So the next day, on these two corners of the intersection, um, they, you know, they interviewed the traffic guard, they helped kids get to school, they shortened the crossing distance, made pedestrians more visible. Um, the project was, was working as intended. And the city didn't like it. So speaking of you know, saying no to things or saying yes to things, the city of Hamilton decided to say no, that it was illegal and potentially unsafe to say nothing of the existing conditions. So the advocates fought back. You know, do not approach tactical urbanists directly. <laughs> Which, you know, made quite, quite a lot of noise. Um, see something remotely progressive, <laughs> report it. So you can imagine the city's also maybe not so thrilled about this new online Facebook campaign that's uh, you know galvanizing passion around the city about creating safer streets. Um, but six days later, this was the headline now in the CBC, Hamilton. Now this has gone national in Canada. <laughs> I know their news isn't quite as intense and violent as ours in America, but somehow this made the news. And um, the city sat down with you know the Society of Architects. They outed themselves and said, yes, we funded it. Yes, we did it an otherwise well-respected group of you know, uh, upstanding individuals in the community. And so then uh, about 10 days later, the city went out and they painted high visibility crosswalks, they created the temporary curb extensions, and they said, we'll give it a shot, we'll make it a pilot project. Um, so there you see it on the two intersections, those two corners. And amazingly, the city had all this positive feedback. You know, if you work for a city, and I work with a lot of cities, they don't get enough positive feedback. And so this felt really good to get this, this people saying, we want this, this is great, let's do more of this. And so they did. Um, by September of, of 2013, the city had actually implemented 75 different intersection upgrades using this temporary pilot kit of parts. And then behind that, they've been implementing permanent cur curb and concrete ever since. As of last spring, last time I spoke to Graham, they had done more than 105 different projects. So the small thing, you know, the little pinprick can you know, help heal the whole, the whole system. Um, that's what happened in Hamilton. 
So in Morgan Hill, you know, um, very different kind of story, more suburban town, south of San Jose, California. We did this as part of a planning process. So this is more in the, not a, a guerrilla or unsanctioned activity. This is more of the collaborative demonstration. They w had basically completed a, um, a six-month or eight-month-long planning process about complete streets in their downtown. And the lead consultant hired us to then demonstrate these two options on either side of a median that divided the main street. And so we decided to test out um, uh, buffered bike lanes in place of a travel lane. And we tested out more pedestrian space in place of a travel lane. And we said, look, it's up to you. Do you guys like the pedestrian option or do you like the bike option? And this was in the ground for several days. And we collected lots of feedback. And what was really exciting about the project is that the community had been debating the, these kinds of changes for a very long time. And there was no action on the ground. So what this did was it put it out on full view for the community to look at. Um, the city council then decided to invest in a six-month pilot to get real representative data on how it's working, et cetera. So that six-month pilot went through the bulk of, uh, or half of 2014. They extended the pilot because it was working quite well. And at the end of that, they decided to unfortunately not do um, the full-on lane closure. So they kept the downtown at four lanes, but they did implement a lot of the other recommendations like curb extensions and expanding the median and making pedestrian upgrades with short-term projects. So ultimately, they didn't go with the full vision idea, but they did get a lot of improvements done, and they did so very inexpensively and very quickly um, throughout the downtown area. So it's kind of a, a lesson learned there. Um, in a workshop setting, you know, in rural communities, um, this was actually this, this past um, April, uh, sorry, March, in uh, Montana. So I was in Great Falls, Montana, and I was doing a training with nine different uh, communities from around the state. And what we did was a crosswalk um, demonstration where there wasn't one, just to get them, you know, their engines fired up about doing these kinds of projects and train them on how to get on the ground and do it. Um, what was really heartening, and, and this was just a couple weeks old, coming out of that training, the community of Whitefish went out and decided to do a 13 block long pilot bike lane, protected bike lane demonstration for their kids on bike to school day. Um, we've never done a 13 block long demonstration project. That's, I mean, if, you, if you've been in the trenches with, you know, with PS21, you know that's kind of insane. Um, but they did it, and that's what that looked like on bike to school day. And now they're getting this, these streets uh, into their plan, their, up, their plan update to actually invest in them to make it safer for kids to bike through the neighborhood to get to school. Um, in terms of public space, this is a project in Penrith, Australia. This was also in conjunction with a plan on the backside of a 18-month-long um, master plan for their main street. Um, uh, Penrith, by the way, is a town of about 20,000, so it's about the same size as Portsmouth. And they had this space at the end of this main street, which was gated off, hot in the summer, cold in the winter, fairly ugly. And that's what it became within one month. So we flew over there with a colleague of ours who did the plan. And in the plan, she said, you have to keep momentum going. You can't just put a plan on the shelf and expect it to get built. You've got to build something immediately so people know that you're serious about it. So we did a workshop with about 40 residents and business owners and came up with a vision right there that day. And the city committed $40,000 of money to implement it within one month. So not a little, about, little amount of money, but also not a lot of money. And what they committed to was a six-month process of analyzing what was working, what was not. And if it totally failed, they would rip it out, no harm, no foul. If it worked, then they might consider it for the long term. See some images there of it being activated. This is a whole half block of a street. Um, and what they found through the, the six-month pilot is it was a big success. Um, there were some tweaks that were needed, of course, but they wanted the, the pop-up park to stay, so it's still there. And it's a placeholder for the $3 million investment that's coming whenever they find $3 million. But in the interim, it's good enough for now, and it's providing public space and support to businesses in a way that was um, not happening in the past. And they've also learned from this. Now they're doing pop-up projects elsewhere. So it's become part of their planning process, part of the DNA in the city is to think, how can we do a demonstration and a pilot uh, to, to help get people engaged, to implement, and move forward? Final example before I get to um, some work in Burlington is work my partner Tony has been doing in Miami. Um, Tony lives about four houses away from the 6.2 mile corridor that runs north-south um, in Miami. And it's owned by a railroad company and he wants to transform it with a lot of other advocates into um, this amazing trail. How do you prototype a, tra a trail? That's, that's difficult. You know, we often work at the block scale and a parking lot, smaller things. He wants to do 6.2 miles. So he takes this idea to other neighborhood groups. He takes it to other advocates and they formed a group called Friends of the Ludlam Trail. And they created a vision and they had a charrette 
in November. And part of the vision working with the county and the railroad company was how do we get people actually out onto the trail and not just look at a pretty picture, but experience it too. And so November of 2014, the charrette, and then November 2015, you can see the uh, permission was given from the railroad company to start activating the trail, segments of it, to get to be more experiential on a monthly basis. So now they have what's called Ludlam Days, which on, on that monthly basis, different programming happens every month to bring people there that's very open, very it's free, it's uh, family friendly, and it's the uh, railroad company that's paying for it. Now, if you ever try to work with a railroad company, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, but this is in line with their vision to ultimately redevelop um, about a quarter of the parcels along the corridor, and they see the trail as a way to add value to those properties that will eventually redevelop. Another vision of, of Ludlam Nights. I actually lit up the trail one of the evenings as well. And so the, you know, step by step by step, the development company, the rail company, um, after getting people on the trail, that first event kind of had this aha moment. So they went out and they put crushed gravel on part of the trail as well. So now it's even more accessible than it was before. So with all these examples, um, we've learned you can do pretty much anything if you wear an orange vest. <laughs> Which, by the way, for safety reasons, we'll all be wearing orange vests tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. Um, so I want to end on this, because this is one of our, our, our latest projects, um, and it kind of brings all these parts and pieces of other projects in the past together. And we've had a very willing and wonderful client uh, in Burlington, Vermont. And so they hired us along with a engineering firm called Dubois and King that's based uh, in Vermont to do their first, the city's first bicycle and pedestrian master plan. And it's a pretty aggressive plan, I'm gonna be honest. We have a, it's a 10 year vision. It's $55 million to implement everything in the plan. Um, and that's a, you know, that's a difficult ask on a small community like that, a small city. Um, presently, you can see the network, the orange lines and the green, it's pretty disconnected. Um, amazingly though, Burlington has a bicycle mode share already of about 6% with disconnected infrastructure. Uh, they have a walk mode share of about 20%. So it's very high compared to most US cities. If you don't know anything about, when I say mode share, I mean the way that people get to and from work. Um, and to have more than 1% bike share in the US is, is, is good. They have six is great, but they wanna go even higher. They wanna double that. And so we've created a vision for them and a network. Those blue lines are a protected bike lane network. So you could be in the north, the south, or on the UVM campus or downtown and never be that far from a protected bike lane that would get you throughout the whole city. Um, and we wanna, again, increase those, um, the, basically decrease the driving mode share from about 54% of single occupancy trips in cars down to 37%. So people have a lot more options to get around. But how do you take a big plan like this, that's $55 million, and implement it? Remember those angry people with the pitchforks I showed you earlier? They live in Burlington too. <laughs> as progressive as they like to think that they are. So they've had a lot of demand from neighborhood groups and from advocacy organizations to do tactical urbanism. And the cities had no way to say yes to them. And so as part of our work, they came to us and said, look, we, we know you do these demonstration projects. Is there any way you could write a policy for us where we could say yes? So on top of doing the bike plan, we've written now a, um, uh, uh, a public works policy that allows them to do this. So you can har you know, harness the energy and the volunteerism of groups like PS21 in Portsmouth in, in Burlington to implement and try things out, to show neighbors that it's not so scary to repurpose some of our space, to try out different progressive ideas for infrastructure that no one's seen in Burlington before. Um, so it's a pretty exciting opportunity, we think. And so that um, guide and policy, it's a policy for the city, but it's really a guide for citizens on how to do these projects, um, is now being reviewed by Public Works and hopefully will be drafted very soon. And the whole point is to take the demonstration projects to the pilot phase. The city already has a pilot ordinance, and they're using the demonstrations to kind of feed into that to figure out where they should invest more of their dollars to get these projects that are in that queue in the 10-year plan happening faster. Um, so that permit process, it looks a little complicated on the screen, I know, but it's, it's four basic steps. You basically you develop your idea, you share it with the city. We have these predisposed um, kinds of projects. There are six basic projects you can do as of right. You can do others, but these ones are pre-programmed in. Uh, the city reviews it. If you're good to go, then you basically go to stage three, which is you notify abutters and business owners and whoever else and say, you know, we're doing this project. If you don't get permission, then you go back to the square one, you make some adjustments, then you resubmit, get your permission and move forward. 
And then you basically build the project and then you write your thank you notes and say that was great and did it work or did it not work? What did we learn? So the whole process is intended to take about 45 days from idea to implementation, um, which is not overnight. Um, we've had to move a little bit faster here in, Berlin, uh, sorry, in, um, in Portsmouth the last uh, three weeks or so, um, but it allows plenty of time for the city to really be involved and understand what's being done on the streets. And you know, we look at history. We always look at history in communities that we work in. Burlington did this back in 1971. This is a demonstration project on that main street I showed you at the beginning, the pedestrian street, to transform that into a pedestrian mall. Um, you know, a lot of pedestrian malls didn't work very well in the United States for a number of reasons we can get into later, but they want to show that not only the street could be closed to cars, but also that you could dine outdoors. At this time, you couldn't eat outdoors in Vermont. It was illegal. You know, they thought it was unsanitary. Imagine that. Um, so it became what, you know, it became Church Street today based on that process. So we showed that to them and said, you, you can do this, you've done it before. It's actually created, it's been the process that created the, the best street in town. Um, so we worked um, to actually take our draft policy last September and do four different demonstration projects to test out our own process. So you can see the blue lines there, that's their open streets route. So we want to actually connect the orange and, and um, red lines to that route. So those streets would be open to cars and they'd cross over and connect to the streets that were not open to cars during open streets. So we'd test out bikeways. And on the left there, that's the south end. They were having this event called the Art Hop. 10,000 people come out over the course of the weekend. And we wanted to actually um, program and activate the space. So very, you know, we had about $4,000 total in funding for this, which um, partially came from the city council. Um, we wanted to engage the community in our plan. So this is not about showing up to a, a room and having me yap at you and show you maps, but actually getting out into the street. Um, and then test our own process, as I mentioned earlier. One of the very quick pain points that we realized that when you're working at such a big scale, multiple streets and multiple blocks, we need a traffic management plan. That's easy to do on a single block. It's much more complicated for citizens. And so if the city is going to actually allow uh, demonstration projects, then we had to get over this gap. So we realized that very quickly. So in our policy and in our guide, citizens can actually partner with engineering firms um, pro bono to actually help you know, create these traffic management plans, or the city is also committed to doing up to four per year. So we're able to get over that hurdle. So that's the site before. Now, I'm telling you, they keep the street open, so there's 10,000 people on a five-foot sidewalk. Can you imagine how uncomfortable that gets during the art hop? And dangerous, actually. So that was the after. So that was temporary paint, that's uh, crates, similar to what you'll see tomorrow, and cones, and then that, that tent right there is where we set up to have conversations with people about the master planning process and how they can get involved and how this kind of infrastructure is what we're trying to achieve uh, middle to long term in the city to make it more friendly to people. And then site two, these three bikeway types, which I mentioned. Um, this is a bike lane that already existed. The idea was actually to flip the parking with the bike lane. It just turned out that the bike lane was seven feet and the parking lane was also seven feet. So just the minimum space we needed to do uh, this project. So you can see we bumped the parking out and created this. And so that's a protected bike lane that ran for about 950 feet and connected to two other bikeways as well as the open streets route. And what we realized is that going into it, we knew that the sight lines weren't really good getting in and out of those driveways. Probably wasn't the best idea for cycling, but we wanted to show that this kind of infrastructure could be built. Um, and then we used planter protected bike lanes. That little boy was able to ride on his own on a city street for the very first time. His dad took that photo. And then we did what's called a neighborhood greenway. So how do you prioritize low speed, low volume streets for playing, cycling, walking, things like that, and then put down those high visibility Shero markings up and down the street. And then we did intersection treatments to connect all these things together. So when you reach the intersection, you see some green paint. You've got some uh, chevrons and treatments across the intersection so you know where you should be placed as a cyclist. You know, as a driver, you know where the cyclists are supposed to be as you get across the street. And then we celebrated the opening of these projects with Open Streets BTV. Uh, and one of the things, you know, we love to invite the people who like to say no to come experience our projects. So if you, you know, is anyone from the fire department? We had someone from the fire department at our workshop a couple weeks ago, and he was great because he seemed supportive. And clearly they are because we're, we're moving forward with this project. But in Burlington, they were skeptical. So we brought them out and said, okay, we know it's a little narrower than you want. Um, we know it's kind of scary for you as a fire department, but just come out and prove it to us that you can't get down the street. And it was, in fact, a little tight when they um, got the, the stanchions out from the side of the, the trucks, which they do to support it and when they take the ladder up. Um, 
but you know, it allowed us to have that conversation in space and build trust. Um, we, we normally don't talk to the mail person. Um, the mail person this day when we were setting this up was, uh, was ticked off. <laughs> he had no idea what we were doing, didn't know why we were doing it. And we said, well, look, we're trying to improve cycling, we're trying to improve walking. And we said, this is only temporary, it's only a demonstration. And very quickly, he went from being very mad to being very interested and wondering um, what he could do to support that project because half the time when he's driving around delivering the mail, he's also a pedestrian. So he knows the perils of walking around these neighborhoods too. And of course, we have a lot of fun. So what did we learn? We measured speeds before and after this project. Um, and we learned that you know, speeding was happening more than 25% of the time on both of these corridors. Um, and then with the project in place, that went down to about five or 6% on each. So speed was reduced pretty dramatically over the course of the three days. Um, and then all these, these uh, little experiments informed our actual plan. So this is North Winooski, that street where we flipped the parking. And we decided not to actually have parking on the street because when we were on the one side where the bike lane is, because we were doing the demonstration, we had all the neighborhood residents out there asking questions, getting involved, even selling lemonade. And what we learned was that none of them park on the street there, on that side of the street. They all park off street with their driveways that go behind the homes. Um, it's the people who visit downtown and don't want to pay the meters, which are one block away, that park on that street. And so when we proposed taking the parking away, they said, no problem. That's a pretty rare answer in a neighborhood, um, but that's how we got to it. And then this way, we were able to improve the sight lines in all the driveways, get the protected bike lane in the short term with these temporary um, buffers and vertical elements, um, and then the long term, create a much more beautiful street that handles stormwater management, has a mountable curb, which made the fire department happy so they could get to the curbside or get onto properties to fight fires or deal with emergencies. So it was a win, win, win. And we only arrived at this solution by the demonstration project. We never would have gotten there um, if we just looked at the street on Google Earth and decided to, to draw what fit. Because we had to figure out how the street was utilized to make it all work. And the city learned that this whole short-term action thing is actually a lot of fun, too. So they took a lot of the intersection treatments within six weeks and implemented them not only here in our project site area, but all around the city. So this movement, um, which is now, you can see, has gone from the gorilla to the less gorilla, is being developed as programs and policies with cities. Uh, that's the exciting part for us. We think there's always going to be the unsanctioned middle-of-the-night work that should, in my opinion, that's fun, that should continue in some ways. Um, but really, how can cities... Um, almost not need citizens to do that. How do we enable more of this stuff to happen? And so what we see a process that's emerging, which is more open to people, uh, it's more iterative, and allows for this cycle of the two-day quick demonstration, the pilot to collect more long-term data, and then the interim design between you know, the project going in and then the capital dollars catching up so you can bring benefit in the short term um, to communities all over. So we've been testing this idea uh, with uh, Auckland, New Zealand. Auckland built this amazing bike path recently. They call it the light path. Um, and it connects uh, two sides of the downtown along a freeway. Um, and this is part of a mandate in Auckland to spend $200 million on bikeways in three years. And when we were there last year, they had just announced this mandate. And um, I was in town to do a number of different things. They said, you need to come to a workshop with us because we have no idea how to spend that much money that fast. <laughs> how are we actually going to make good on, on our commitment? Um, so the idea was to take a lot of engineers who are comfortable behind computer screens and in classrooms like this and get them out on the street to actually do some of these demonstrations. And we said, you can deliver these in a very quick way. You can hopefully deal with some of the political pushback by doing the demonstrations and challenging neighborhoods first before you commit to these big projects like the light path so that you don't have, you know, NIMBYs blocking all of your projects. Now you can imagine there's not a lot of NIMBYs along a highway, so that's pretty easy actually to pull off. It's expensive, but it's easy. Getting to the neighborhood fabric would be a lot easier. So that's the process they've been utilizing. And we also worked with Auckland Council to develop an activation program for their city center. They're experiencing $10 billion worth of development in the next few years in downtown Auckland. Huge amount of money, including new rail links that are digging up streets. And so they want to use tactical urbanism to create you know, installations and uh, activate streets and help businesses out during times of construction and interruption. So they're calling it really a strategy for disruption management. And so you can see here their whole plan. They've got their downtown plan. They have now we have this, we help them formulate this Activate Auckland program, which allows bottom-up activity and artists to get engaged and make spaces more comfortable and try things out while you have all this disruption. So while you're already doing all the construction work, you might as well try some other things as well. You know, if you're narrowing your lanes from four down to two, great. 
that's because of the construction, but now's the time to try that out actually as a two lane street. Maybe you put it back as a two lane street moving forward. So we're really, really talking about now is embedding this into practice in a way that helps us build better cities faster. And you know, it's not about the single project. It's not about the parklet like you see here in San Francisco. It's not about the one curb extension on Islington Street. It's about how we embed these ideas and create scalability citywide. This is the number of parklets that now have been built in San Francisco. So what you're seeing is whole corridors, being neighborhoods being transformed. If, like that one corridor that you see north south there with all the circles, that's Valencia Street. You set a pattern. When you start to realize as a business that you can make more money with more people sitting in front of your store, then it creates a more pleasant street, more people start walking, then it's a pretty good investment on the front end to do this, which is why you see more than 60 different parklets and more coming in the city of San Francisco. So it's not about the one thing, but in aggregate, you get to transform the city streets. Um, and um, with that, I'll say we need to be tactical, but also strategic. It's not one or the other. These things have to work together, and we need tactics to help implement, implement our strategies. And it just feels good to get things done. So to close, what the heck are we doing on Islington Street? Quite a bit. Um, and so it's going to be a fun, a fun morning tomorrow. So it, for those who, who weren't part of the workshop a couple weeks ago, um, I came to town, and we had probably about uh, 40 or 45 people really enthusiastic, really want to see improvements made on Islington. Um, there's plenty of opportunities as we found. We, we actually received more than 102 different ideas through the workshop. Um, we're not gonna implement all of them. Um, that would be impossible, but we are actually taking the spirit and a number of the actual recommendations and getting them on the ground. So we're doing a crosswalk um, at Albany Street and White Heron, which we understand has been long desired uh, by the community. We're doing a big curb extension to shorten the crossing distance and raise the visibility of pedestrians at Bartlett Street and Islington. Um, we're gonna actually put on-street parking back onto Islington to calm the traffic and provide more um, places for the businesses that are located there for their patrons. Um, we're gonna add sharrows onto the street so that cyclists are a little bit made a little bit more visible while they're coming up and down Islington. We're gonna program some of the, the uh, parking lot spaces at White Heron as well. Um, so we're seeing these little things along a, one block, and what we're hoping for is to see what works, what doesn't, get your feedback, um, hopefully uh, get the city interested in on how some of these elements might be incorporated with, with the VHB's plan moving forward. Um, so here's the street today, and if you can read the plan, this is kind of the vision for tomorrow. So you can see in the, in the intersection there how we'll reclaim some of that space for the curb extension, the on-street parking spaces in front of White Heron and there, oh, sorry, and then the parklet as well in front of White Heron. Um, and you can see that curb extension and the crosswalk as well at Albany Street. That's kind of the core elements of the project. And we'll be out there at 5 a.m. Uh, hopefully we'll be done by 9 a.m. because that's when the police detail ends. Um, and we encourage you to come out and walk, bike, Go to the local businesses, ask questions, uh, get involved, and advocate for a safer Islington Street moving forward. Um, and we hope this is just a start. You know, this is one project. There's been a ton of volunteer time. PS21 has been great in ushering this through, but it'd be really wonderful to have this process be something that other groups can do and other neighborhoods can do and other businesses can do moving forward in Portsmouth. So we're kind of the guinea pigs um, and, and are excited about the outcomes uh, in the future. So thank you. So I, I think we'll do some questions. Is that right? Hey, that wasn't so bad. So, questions? Hi, I know you heard about the um, parking lot at CVS Drugstore. Mm -hmm. uh, it empties out onto Islington Street and it's treated as if it's a street and it's confusing for drivers and pedestrians and it's not square with Bartlett Street. Um, Further, there's going to be new apartments in the old, I guess, brewery building, mm -hmm. uh, micro apartments. So it's going to be more traffic coming through that cut-through street. 
So if we're tactical urbanists, I know we're not going to deal with this tomorrow, but looking to the future, um, any strategies that you would recommend for dealing with um, this particular problem? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So this, this came up a lot in the, um, in the workshop, for those who weren't there. And um, it's very clearly an issue. You can just visually see the challenge of that intersection. Um, we actually have attempted, um, with Doug and others, to uh, ameliorate that condition to a degree. And so uh, if you notice, when you are walking along the sidewalk there, there's two handicapped accessible spaces that are right in front of the door, um, which is great for access. But what it does is it makes it a really challenging entrance to get in and out. And so the proposal to CVS, which we're hopefully we'll hear back maybe even tomorrow morning, is to actually just move those two spaces just over slightly and create more of a welcoming uh, entrance to the store. Um, and what that would do is it means that you wouldn't have those cars backing in and out right there as cars are coming in and out, which is a very dangerous condition. Um, so in the very short term, you could probably just tinker with where those spaces are located and retrofit those two spots to be more um, of an entryway, you know, landscape, whatever it might be, to get in and out. And the middle term, say in the next several months, you know, um, well, what we learned is that street's not actually a public street. It's not owned by the city. It's really, it's private land. So people who are cutting through aren't on a public right-of-way. So the city at this point um, can't necessarily swoop in quickly and make changes. Um, but the CVS and other property owners might be interested in, in tweaking that. Or you could propose tweaking it and just trying it out for a couple days and see if, if it's really difficult for people to get from the backside in or have other access to, to the property. Um, you know, if you pitch it as a two-day, one-day, just a trial to see what works, and they might be amenable to that, I wouldn't say let's just close it down permanently because that's not going to probably fly with, with CVS's corporate ownership or the store manager. But the small things might be a way to open that conversation and look at how the, in the longer term that could inform VHB's work on what that realignment of that intersection might look like and how that um, access can be improved to and from CVS without really detracting from the safety of all people on the street and the walkability. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Bob Graham from Portsmouth. I have two questions. Um, number one, um, are you aware that if we add three parking spaces in front of uh, White Heron, that the city of Portsmouth is going to charge them 5,000 bucks a piece for that per year? Okay, number one, how do you get past that? Number two, since I've been around here since 1989, everybody that heads south on Islington Street to go underneath that bridge at Butler Street, habits are habits, and people stream through there 25, 30 miles an hour if they get the green arrow. What do you do about liability in a situation like that when you are moving out the curb mm -hmm. and you're keeping the crosswalk in the same spot, knowing that people's habits are going to be continuous tomorrow because not everybody in Portsmouth is here tonight that's going to know about sure, what's going sure. on tomorrow. Right. And the police detail ends at 9, so what's the liability to you all should someone get killed in that intersection? Right. Well, the, um, to answer your first question, um, I didn't know that, uh, being the, the $5,000. That's that. Fee has certainly been waived for the, the duration of the project, so, so to test that out. I mean, that's a city ordinance issue that you'd have to work on in, you know, with the city and everyone else who might not want to pay $5,000 for a parking space. The notion of it and the idea of it, though, in the short term is to show how that would help uh, calm the traffic, the speed, particularly right there when, as you probably know, people are picking up speed to make that right turn. If we narrow that just to one lane and organize the street a little bit more clearly, it would slow that down a little bit. Um, so that's the intent of the project. In terms of um, liability or the issues around the, the, the curb extension is that, um, the, again, back to the, um, the design of the street, uh, in doing this kind of work, both long-term planning and design and with a lot of these short-term demonstrations, we've never seen or had anyone get hurt, um, which is not the case with the status quo condition where people do get hurt all the time. Um, so the, the city is, um, you know, could be on the hook for all those crashes and things that do happen presently, um, but are not paying out fines or, or paying legal fees for all those different kinds of crashes. So the same kind of approach and liability structure is going to hopefully protect this project as well, which the city has given express permission for. Um, by changing the geometry and slowing those turns, I mean, you're, you're going to have very visible cones. You know, you're going to have a very clear difference. You've got the warning sign in advance of the intersection. That is basically, that's due diligence on the city side, on our side, 
to inform and warn motorists that there's a change to the traffic pattern, just like you would do with a construction project or any change to the right-of-way that happens all the time in towns and cities. So we're basically following that process um, to utilize and implement this project. Uh, does does your project or tomorrow include the the train trestle under Bartlett Street? Um, we are looking at a couple ways uh, to make that more comfortable for walking. We're not going to change anything to the uh, to the street uh, between the curbs, but we know that as you walk around uh, on the sidewalk, there it can be you know cars are whipping through and it's pretty close. So we're trying to find a little bit of a physical barrier between those driving and those walking. So that's probably the extent of which we'll deal with that piece of it tomorrow. Thank you. Sure. More questions? Um, this is related to the person who was um, worried that people who aren't here today might not know what's coming um, down at that intersection. And, and I thought the same thing, too. And I actually was wondering if you were putting signs starting at Cabot Street that are, hey, be prepared to think differently, or something like that, I mean, at various different poles. So, so it's not um, like, wow, this is totally different and I'm not prepared for it. I mean, they could be temporary signs that could come down, but I, I was worried about that too. Yeah, sure. So we, we have the big um, message board signs, the solar powered message board signs up announcing the change in traffic pattern. Um, I don't think we have FYI signs up and down the street, but the, again, the advance warning signs and then just the sheer design of the street will inform people that things are different. And, and quite honestly, we're, we're okay if some people are upset. That's actually part of this process is that, you know, not everyone loves change, um, but we want to see how it works in this configuration temporarily. And if there is negative feedback, which there'll probably be some, and there's a lot of positive feedback, then we can weigh those pros and cons in some of the, you know, the next steps advice or how the city looks at this project moving forward as part of their, their planning process. Also, uh, in advance of uh, White Heron, the city is going to put cones on the street, oh, so it's not suddenly. Yeah, right. yeah. So, so it's not suddenly. Yeah. It's going to become a n more narrow street. In, in terms of the immediate abutters and business owners and landowners, uh, PS Twenty One's gone door to door to door to door to door and talked to most people over and over about this project. So, um, within the immediate influence of what we're where we're doing the work, everyone knows it's going on. Um, so we have that support, and that's why a lot of our partners are based right there who also want to see, you know, a safer, more organized, pedestrian-friendly street. Yeah, as a frequent bike, bicycle rider around Portsmouth, I got to say, this is one of the most d dangerous intersections in all of Portsmouth. It's really, really bad. Even in driving through it, it's bad. Yeah. Because of the speed, because of the angle, you know, it just invites acceleration. So I'm super happy to hear about this project, I gotta say. It's really gonna be great. And and all the other projects you guys have done, it's it's amazing. You're kind of like hacking space here. It's really it's really cool. You're bringing that sort of agility of software development and you know fast iterations and learning from failure. I'm really impressed. Really it's been great to be here and see this. Great. Thank you. Come out and see it tomorrow. And ride your bike. <laughs> More questions. Um, there's there's some uh, things that happen on that street because of the way the lights are configured as well. Um, you know, the fact that there isn't a right turn light on Islington Street coming, uh, I guess that would be west, mm -hmm. um, heading towards Barlett Street. So, for example, people blow that red light all the time because they know, well, if these guys are turning left, they've got a green arrow, so I should have one, but there's not one there. Right. Uh, additionally, people coming east on Islington Street, you know, seven, eight cars through the red light, turning left to go underneath the uh, the um, the trestle. And I'm wondering, you know, I mean, this is this is something I I've lived in town for eight years, and I just can't understand how the city hasn't even looked at changing the light structure a little bit. Um, I, I assume that you guys have some thoughts about that potentially. Yeah, I mean, in, in this kind of project, if it were to move forward, it's a kind of location where, um, you know, possibly considering a ban of right turn on red, um, and you have some volume challenges, some congestion, and some queuing that would probably not make that so politically um, 
uh, important or uh, politically accepted by a lot of people driving through town, but there's always that opportunity. Um, there are things like leading pedestrian intervals as well, so that if you had this curb extension actually made more permanent, was built out to be more friendly to people, not such high speed turning cars, um, a leading pedestrian interval is basically you get the walk sign before the people driving get the green sign. So you get to start crossing the street in advance of the car being able to make their turn. So then you're immediately made more visible in the crosswalk um, from the outset. Um, so that in terms of signals, that's a little bit of the tweaking that you could do. Um, clearly not everyone's gonna respond uh, and follow the law. And so you know some levels of targeted enforcement um, is, is another opportunity working with the, the police department or you know, if it's such an issue or bad uh, or big challenge, other states, I'm not sure about the law in New Hampshire, but other states are now legalizing uh, cameras that would actually, you know, um, snap pictures of people who are violating laws and send you the ticket in the mail um, or an email. So there's, I mean, there's a number of ways to try and deal with that, but like when it comes down to it, we just want the geometry, the design of the street to inform how people behave. And we can't control 100% of the time all behavior, but we think we can actually organize and improve the behavior by the majority by these tweaks that we're gonna try out tomorrow. And you know, not everything is gonna work perfectly tomorrow. That's always the case with these projects. We learn from the things that don't work great, um, but that's exactly what we're trying to get to is what will work and feed that information to the VHB team and the city team to think about long-term as they construct and reconstruct or reconstruct this, um, this corridor and, and that intersection in particular. All right. I have one question continuing over there. Because we have a camera, so it's just it's on the mic. One question on this gentleman is, um, have you had an opportunity to talk to Two Brothers Garage? Because if you look at that street, as you're heading from the bridge to head south on by Two Brothers, that's uh, 94 degrees. As you're heading south to go on Bartlett Street, that's 87. So those are almost complementary degrees. My question is, uh, that telephone pole has been a big problem for the longest time in this town because people just can't get through there and traffic just backs up underneath the bridge forever. So do you ever get involved in your implementation with the government to actually physically move that pole back and round that corner a little bit more to make it like Papa Wheels? It's hard to do that in two days. Uh, <laughs> but yes, yeah, yeah, I mean, that would be one of the key. I mean, that's a, that's a very spot-specific challenge that could be overcome by saying that pole needs to be moved, but on the same time, I know there's been ideas flowed in the past and concepts that would actually not only move that pole, but completely realign that street. So I think all small to big moves would be on the table for rethinking particularly that intersection. So I think it's a good point to raise. Um, we're not going to deal with that specifically tomorrow, unfortunately, but um, that could be something that came out of our analysis. I just want to applaud the group, uh, PS21, and, and you for coming here and the city for allowing this demonstration to happen. I mean, I've lived in the city for 30 years, and that intersection is, I would describe that as three decades of accrued uh, bad land use decisions, neglected transportation signaling, and inadequate pedestrian signals. And I really look forward to seeing what you lay out tomorrow, and I can't imagine it will be anything but an improvement. <laughs> and and I really, I, I, I live on Thornton Street, and I, uh, I drive through that intersection a lot, but I walk through it a lot. Right. And I'm a transportation planner, mm. and I think that is one of the most dangerous intersections in the city. And what I would really encourage everyone to do during the demonstration and then after when it's returned you may be very familiar with driving through that intersection and you know drive through with the change drive through when it's returned but what i really want to encourage people to do is if you haven't done it park at plaza 800 or nearby and go over and walk through that intersection and try to cross each leg of the intersection as a pedestrian with the existing right. signals and the existing buttons which i don't even think are fully ada compliant and just try it experience it as a pedestrian experience it as a bicyclist and let's give great feedback to the city on how we can make that whole zone better mm -hmm. for businesses for pedestrians for bicyclists and for motorists because it is so under potential i mean that intersection that area can be so much better and i look forward to this being the start of us making it better great thank you yeah the uh when i measured it in google earth when doug first email me the intersection last fall. Uh, I 
measured at 80, more than 80 feet across three lanes of traffic. So that's, that's unacceptable. You know, that's way too far for someone to cross on a single light. With this one lane, that's not even really a lane. It's right. Not a right. So we'll hopefully see better outcomes tomorrow. Any more questions? What, what data are you going to be collecting tomorrow? Where is that? Ah, I couldn't see you with the light. Um, I don't think we've organized uh, within three weeks to do some really proper data collection, although we do have an evaluation survey that we've uh, developed with, well, Doug's developed it uh, mostly the last um, 24 hours. That's now on the PS21 website. There'll be stacks of those evaluation uh, surveys at the businesses, um, White Heron, et cetera. So we want, you know, we're really looking at qualitative feedback at this point. Does it feel safer? Does it look better? Is, you know, is it the kind of place where you want to walk with these changes in place? Um, and start there. Um, I think moving forward, some of these elements may or may not be able to stay. You know, some of them are actually very conducive to the six-month pilot test. So I could see some of the curb extension treatments, some of the crosswalk, the bike treatments, the parklet. Some of that stuff, the city, if they wanted to, could invest a small amount of dollars in the very short term this summer and test it through, say, November, and do the evaluation, speeds, you know, counts, um, cars, bikes, walkers, et cetera. And you know, quite frankly, if some of the businesses wanted to, to play ball, we could look at sales receipts and see if there's any improvement with making a safer, more accessible street. That's another key data collection point that often comes with street changes before and after. So some of the things. So the website is ps21.info, and there is a survey up there right now. Uh, and also, the city is doing some sort of uh, speed check. It's kind of a general one, and they're doing a before and after. Uh, so we're not clear what kind of data that will show, but it, uh, they're making right. an effort in that regard. Sorry, I forgot about that one. Thanks, Doug. Any other questions? Um, not that I'm aware of, but they're they're usually here, I would say, and uh, they've been very supportive. I think there's a master planning meeting tonight, so I think that's where the planning are. And Eric Eby will be there tomorrow morning at uh, 4.30. And uh, Juliet Walker will be there also. So, And there were four or five, if not more, city employees at our workshop a couple weeks ago. So they were very supportive of us, yes. which is great. I just wanted to add, you know, Juliet Walker, she's, she's collected data for, for pedestrians. Actually, I did it. Okay. I sat at that intersection for... A few days and click, click, click. Yeah, I'd made hash marks of all okay. the cyclists. I don't obviously I don't remember the statistics. I did it last summer. Okay, but it, they exist. Okay, that's great. Well, we have some so. po or let's say pre data to look at. I did not see that, so I will ask Juliet for it. Right. So the the city has given us a thousand dollars toward this project. They're also bringing cones. Um, they're supplying pallets. Uh, they're doing really quite a bit on this. So. Uh, the key point will be whether or not anything comes of it, I suppose. But uh, you know, they're at least uh, giving us a chance to demonstrate what could be done. More questions? Hi, um, I'm wondering how did this process come about? Was this did the town recognize a problem and approach you, or did you approach them? And secondly, have you designed and proposed a more elaborate permanent? plan or is this test tomorrow to kind of arrive at your recommendations? Good question. So um, maybe Doug can half answer this, but Doug called me on the phone last September or October, I think, and said, we'd love for you to come to Portsmouth. That's how this all started. Doug? Doug Robert, sorry, right there. <laughs> Our MC. And, and so from there, it's been a lot of back and forth and a lot of, you know, fundraising and outreach and organization on behalf, you know, from PS21, um, both for their organization and working with the city to get us where we are today. Um, our contract is entirely, you know, we're working entirely through PS21, even though the city's been very supportive. Um, our work and the results here aren't, our scope is not to develop a formal plan, but hopefully the learnings and the experience and uh, the whole process can not only inform the work moving forward with VHB, which is the consultant team working on the corridor plan for Islington, um, but the process can be something that can be repeated you know, over and over for different kinds of projects in, in Portsmouth. You know, I think there's a real opportunity with a community like this to do more of this kind of stuff. There's a, you know, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of organization. It's a lot of outreach, as PS21 can tell you, and all the volunteers involved. But, um, you know, we've worked within three weeks. We've gotten the money together. We've got the materials together. We've got the city to buy in. In the planning world, that's lightning fast. 
And sometimes these very short deadlines create a lot of momentum quickly to move things forward. So I think there's other moving forward. You know, you might create your Islington Street plan with VHB. And then in that plan, what are the elements that we could actually go in and, and keep testing or do, you know, a year-long pilot, you know, using temporary materials, et cetera. So I think there's a lot of ways this can be incorporated moving, moving forward. Yeah, we went to a lot of meetings where we heard people complaining about that intersection and the dangerousness of uh, Islington Street. So it, this is sort of an attempt to do something about it because we had the same frustrations as everybody that things are moving too slowly. And so we're trying to speed things up and the um, this is just a particular type of project for us, but um, we're interested in getting action on these ideas that people have and as opposed to some of the presentations maybe we've had in the past that a lot of good ideas that um, maybe haven't come to fruition so we're trying to push the envelope a little bit here uh, i moved to portsmouth about a year ago uh, for the purpose of uh, moving to a city where i could bicycle and have an office downtown mm -hmm. so um but to my uh uh, frustration it took a year to find a place to move the office downtown so in the meantime I've been bicycling from Middle Street out to Pease okay well regularly okay. through this intersection through the CVS parking lot right and Wait, man. Um, yes yeah, sort of taking my life into my hands now so I I grew up in the Boston area okay. and what I would say is Portsmouth drivers are not quite as bad as Boston drivers but they are very aggressive mm -hmm. there's a lot of aggressive driving out there and so I think the take home and I, I I'm a landscape architect and urban designer, and you've worked with people I know, yeah, so I'm sure. really glad you're here. But I think the, the bigger picture is this is one intersection, and I know when I moved here a year ago, the bike, the city bicycle and pedestrian plan uh, had just been finished, and it identified 250 other intersections through the city that all needed to be addressed to one. be better places for bicycles and pedestrians. So there's a lot of work to do. Yeah. So the message is so important. And it really, it's just about trying to settle folks down a little bit. And I, I, I hope that that's what I'll, I'll see you tomorrow morning. Great. Um, and I, I'll bring my own orange vest. But um, <laughs> I think it's, uh, it is very important because people actually are, people are getting hurt. And it's also, it, it makes us a less civilized city to have people roaring around corners, right turns, you know, just, just completely um, ignoring the safety. You know, if you look at some of the, um, particularly with our, some of our downtown streets that are two lane, mm -hmm. one way, right. is right. that they're raceways. Right. And sure. we tried to work, you know, to, to, you know, Jeff Speck had some amazing ideas, all of which are entirely implementable through the, actually through the same uh, uh, devices that you use, right. um, that they could all work extremely well in a different format. So hopefully there'll be a wonderful learning curve and experience out of this, but people are going to have to be just a little bit patient and understand that, you know, we're going to maybe, uh, uh, you know, back them off the gas pedal a little bit. Sure, exactly. So maybe, is that it for the questions? We don't have to. That'd be very good. So uh, the uh, feedback form is on the website. There'll be a number of locations around the uh, West End. And thanks to Mike Leiden. Right. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. I hope you have a good night. And uh, I'll stick around for a little while if you want to talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. Thanks. <laughs>